Hello, everyone. I'm Jia Hui. I'm going to talk about collusion resistant copy protection for watermarkable functionalities. This is a joint work with Chi Pong Liu, Luo Wenqian, and Mark Gendry. As properly known by us all, there's a famous theorem in quantum information that says when given an arbitrary unknown quantum state, there's no procedure to turn this state into two copies that's both the same as the original one. And this principle has inspired many uh, constructions of classical impossible primitives, because classical information can always be cloned, and these are the one of the major applications of cryptography using quantum information. For example, quantum key distribution, where two parties can use quantum communication uh, to do key exchange information theoretically. And there is quantum money, which is a pioneering idea brought up by Wiesner uh, many years ago, and uh, which actually inspired the quantum key distribution. And there is quantum copy protection, which we will go into very soon and our signature tokens where you can delegate uh, a signature uh, to others so that it, they can only sign once but not twice. And there is unclonable encryption or decryption where you can make either the ciphertext or uh, the decryption key uh, to be unclonable. So Ericsson in 2009 put forward quantum copy protection. For example, a software company wants to sell a piece of software program that can be uh, abstracted as simply a classical function. But it doesn't want malicious users to pirate this function. So they run a copy protection algorithm that turns this classical function f into a quantum state. They then give this state to the user. So any user who uh, has bought the program, it can use this state to run on any input they like and uh, do the evaluations for arbitrarily polynomial many times that would give them the same evaluation as if they just they are just running the original function. Uh, but what a polynomial adversary, polynomial time adversary cannot do is that they cannot turn this state that they use uh, for the function into uh, two pieces so that both of them can compute the function, the underlying functionality correctly. And this is the security we want or we uh, usually call anti-piracy security for copy protection. Before we go into uh, our results and some technical details, let's make a, a small detour into a classical primitive called watermarking. So in classical cryptography, of course, cryptographers care about copy protecting softwares um, and patents, and uh, they invented something called watermarking. Watermarking says that when given a software that has a watermark embedded inside, one cannot uh, remove the watermark while preserving the functionality. So that basically says while classical information is always clonable, uh, you cannot make illegal copies uh, out of uh, a software that's watermarked. And we will soon see that there's an interesting implicit uh, relation between watermarking and copy protection. And some of the major watermarkable functionalities where uh, people have found uh, provably secure watermarking schemes are cryptographic functions, such as uh, the decryption, uh, pseudorandom functions, and the signing algorithm in signatures. And these will also be the functionalities that we will focus on copy protecting. Uh, as we have just mentioned, uh, there seems to be an implicit relation uh, between watermarking and copy protection. And uh, people asking this paper uh, as an open question, can we copy protect all watermarkable functions? That is, as long as the classical functionality has a classical watermarking scheme, can we just give it a copy protection scheme? And uh, this is uh, also uh, implicitly studied in previous papers. Uh, this, the first constructions for these watermarkable function, major watermarkable functions such as decryption, pseudorandom functions, 
and the signatures in uh, uh, signatures, um, they they are known to be copy protectable under assumption called virtual black box obfuscation, which you can say um, it's the same as using an oracle, um, and and no matter from the cryptography or complexity theoretic point of view, using such uh, such tool is very strong. It's a very very relative uh, very strong relativizing tool using. Uh, people using proofs, and uh, it is also uh, basically impossible to instantiate in many circumstances uh, from the cryptographic point of view. And later on, we improve uh, the constructions for decryption and pseudorandom functions to use a much weaker assumption called I.O., which stands for indistinguishability of classification, together with one-way functions, which is basically nothing compared to uh, obfuscation tool, and uh, these assumptions are much weaker in the sense that there is no impossibility of instantiation for I/O, and there are even some post-quantum candidate constructions for for I/O. And however, uh, signature uh, copy protected signature is actually not really known in in previous works. For this talk, uh, I will focus on one specific copy protection scheme, that is the decryption uh, copy protection for decryption keys. And uh, uh, as we have seen above, it is one of the major watermarkable functions. And by the convention used in previous literatures, we will call such a scheme as unclonable decryption. Um, for now, we also only focus on the security we call one to two security, that is, when given one. Uh, quantum key, the adversary should not be able to generate two. Uh, in such a construction, we would first have a key gen algorithm that takes in a security parameter, outputs a public key, and a quantum uh, decryption key. The public key is completely classical, and then we have an encryption algorithm which is also completely classical. It takes in the public key a message and outputs a ciphertext. Finally, we have uh, the decryption procedure it takes in the quantum decryption key, a ciphertext, and outputs a uh, the original message encrypted. And the, in, in the uh, anti-piracy uh, uh, anti security game, uh, we give the public key and one copy of the quantum decryption key to an adversary, who is a quantum polynomial time algorithm. And it tries to produce two states later on we test uh, these two states with encryptions and uh, try to see if both of them can decrypt. And both, if both of them can decrypt successfully, we say that this adversary has succeeded at uh, pirating the, the decryption key we give it to, uh, give it to, uh, we, we give to it, and, uh, and this is uh, something we want to prevent. And however, you will probably notice that uh, in this scheme, we only give one copy of the decryption key to the adversary. So that means if we show a security using this security notion uh, for a construction, we basically say, okay, I can only give out one copy to the user, basically. That means if all users are malicious, I, I can only sell one copy to all of them. And that's not very ideal. Of course, what we want in the real world is that this software uh, vendor can sell polynomially many copies, and even if all the users they come together and they try to make uh, pirate copies from the given copies uh, together, they should not be able to generate even one additional copy from them. So basically, that's why we care about collusion resistance, which is uh, a name for K to K plus one security, where K is a polynomial. And uh, for the sake of clarity, I will illustrate uh, everything in this talk as a 2 to 3 security, where we would give out two quantum keys. And the adversary, which is basically, uh, you can see it as all the malicious users receiving a quantum key in the real world, and they come together to try to generate one additional copies. And this adversary should not generate three keys that will all work at decrypting, when, they, uh, when it is only given to you. And notice that uh, 
When we test the adversaries at decrypting, they should not communicate. Otherwise, it will be easy for one adversary just uh, or the adversary to just copy uh, the final classical answer from one of the adversary, and that's not really uh, uh, that's that does not really indicate that the adversary has succeeded at copying because we want all keys to be independently uh, successful at decrypting. And, um, and let's again take a look at the previous result. So all these results, um, they are not collusion resistant. So basically all of them only show the one to two security, which is quite uh, restricted when you consider what we need in the real world. And our major contribution in this work is that we not only give a construction for unclonable signing key, uh, which is basically a copy protecting the signing algorithm in um, a, a, a signature scheme using IO and one-way functions, we also make all these uh, previous constructions closure resistant. And for this work, I will just uh, focus on, for this talk, I will just focus on how to make them closure resistant. Uh, and let's go into a slightly more technical details. As I have mentioned, I will focus on only the uh, two to three security setting that says we give out two honest keys and the adversary tries to generate three out of them. Um, so how do we handle collusion resi resistance? We will give a new construction that is basically a, a, a built somewhat black boxly from the previous constructions. Uh, it is very simple. For key generation, we outputs uh, which generate independent public key and decryption key pairs. Um, the, we give out all of them, and we, uh, we we publish all these public keys, and we give out uh, all these quantum keys, which are generated uh, independently uh, to the uh, to the quantum adversary. And to encrypt, we basically just encrypt uh, the message under all of these public keys, and we compose the ciphertext together as one single ciphertext. And to decrypt, of course, uh, no matter which key you hold, as long as you hold one of these valid keys, you should be able to decrypt, because each of these components in the ciphertext, uh, if you decrypt any one of them, you would just get uh, the, the uh, original uh, plain text. Okay, and uh, we can uh, just go into security directly because this construction is very straightforward. The high-level intuition for the security reduction is also uh, quite simple. How do we show occlusion-resistant security? Uh, suppose we issue out two honest keys and the adversary can generate three pirate keys. And as we mentioned, uh, since they must both be able to decrypt the messages we, we encrypt under all the public keys. Uh, then we say that, okay, uh, since there are only two public keys we can encrypt under, but there are three uh, successful pirate keys that can decrypt them, then there must be two pirate keys that decrypt uh, some message that's encrypted under the same public key. And by the pigeonhole principle, we should be able to say that Okay, these two, uh, if we just look at these pyrarchy, two pyrarchies alone, they should be able to help us break uh, the one to two security, which is the single key security uh, shown in previous work of this, corresponding, of this corresponding public key. However, this uh, intuition may not work in the quantum setting since the adversary can make the pyrarchies uh, entangle in some weird way so that if you simply grab two keys and try to do the reduction, it may not work. And the fix to this issue is to actually show uh, that a pigeonhole principle similar to the classic setting works in our quantum setting as well. So we start uh, by using a thought experiment. In this thought experiment, we use a sequence of measurements uh, on each pyro key so that we can actually find out uh, which public key uh, it, it can decrypt the ciphertext under. And, uh, uh, therefore, if we do that to all the keys, we should be able to find out two pyro keys that decrypt uh, the same ciphertext.
and let's in, uh, go into more technical details. Recall that in the collusion resistance scheme, a single ciphertext consists of the composition of encryptions of the same message under all keys, respectively. In this sequence of games, we test the pirate keys under different distributions. In the first game, we test the pirate key on decrypting the original distribution of ciphertext. That is a ciphertext where each component com uh, consists of a ciphertext encrypted under one public key. And by our assumption, the, the adversary should be able to uh, decrypt this ciphertext with a large enough probability. In the next game, uh, we replace the first ciphertext. That's basically the, the ciphertext encrypted under the first public key with a dummy ciphertext that won't help you decrypt. We test uh, the, the leftover pirate key from the previous game on, on this distribution. And uh, uh, we, we, we try to see if there, there will be a noticeable jump in probability uh, that the adversary uh, successfully decrypts. If yes, uh, we, we believe that there should be a large portion of this pirate key that uses the first, uh, uh, that uses the first uh, ciphertext to decrypt. If not, we, we just move on to the next distribution. That is, we also replace the second key with uh, the second ciphertext with a dummy ciphertext that tests the leftover pirate key from the last game. And we know that at the very end, when we turn off all the meaningful ciphertexts ciphertext and replace them with dummy ciphertexts, the pirate key should, be, uh, should have no advantage in decrypting. And we know that at the very uh, beginning, it actually has a large advantage. So there must be something somewhere between these games uh, when you have a large jump in the pirate key success probability when you move from one key, uh, one distribution to the next. Uh, therefore, we can just guess this position where this decryption key has a large jump or large decrease in its success probability at decrypting. Since there are only polynomially many copies, and therefore only polynomially many distributions we can test on, we can just make this guess uh, without too much loss in the reduction. However, another issue comes into the picture. Uh, that is, if we do these sequential measurements again and again until we find this large jumping probability, we notice that we have already uh, uh, moved into a distribution where we hold a key that may not be able to decrypt under the public key. Because the key that actually decrypts, for example, here, we, we turn the ciphertext number two into a dummy ciphertext. And the, the key that's actually uh, able at decrypting ciphertext number two is actually uh, the key we use in the previous distribution. And when we move it, under, uh, move it to the next distribution, we have already disturbed the key in a way that's probably not reversible. So now we have found the gap, but the key we hold are not, uh, is not able to decrypt ciphertext number two. And that does not allow us to do the reduction. It's hard to uh, rewind to the previous game, uh, to the previous state we, we hold. And our solution to this issue is that we make a guess uh, at where this position is just as before, and but we perform the sequential measurements and stop at the game right before the guess position. We then show that if we have guessed the correct position, and the key we hold at this point should be a good pirate key with large enough probability, even though we haven't really made uh, the measurements. And we also uh, guess which is the other pirate key that decrypts under the same ciphertext and make the same sequence of measurements. And we were able to show that we, uh, with only one over poly loss in success probability, we can do a reduction to a one to two security for this guess, the public key uh, we have. And this is only the high level idea for our proof. Uh, please refer to our paper for more technical details. This is basically the end of my talk. Of course, there are still some open problems in this direction. The first thing is whether we can achieve unbounded occlusion resistance instead of uh, 
what we achieve in this paper is called bounded collusion resistance. By bounded collusion resistance, we mean that the setup or the key generation algorithm will depend the number of depend on the number of users, or say dependent on the number of users that will be colluding. And this is uh, this is not ideal. And one thing is that your public key may be very large, and the other issue is that in the real world, of course, uh, a lot of times you do not expect to know the number of users that will buy your keys or the number of users that are malicious at the very beginning when you, when you give out the keys. What you want to do is that I can run the setup algorithm without knowing uh, in the future how many users will be including, and I can just uh, prepare for arbitrarily polynomial many users. And this is what we call unbounded inclusion resistance, where the key generation algorithm does not depend on the number of keys issued. Uh, uh, with our current techniques, uh, we are still not able to achieve this because our reduction is highly dependent on the number of keys issued. And we look forward to working more in this direction in the future. Another open problem, of course, uh, also very interesting, is that whether we can achieve collusion resistant copy protection for all unlearnable functions. Uh, this previous work, uh, which I previously mentioned, that uses a uh, an Oracle or say virtual black box obfuscation does achieve a copy protection scheme for all unlearnable functions. However, it is not easy to see how to turn uh, their scheme into a scheme that's collusion resistant. Thank you very much for being interested in our work. Please refer to our paper for more details and uh, email me if you have any questions.